Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Visionary director Guillermo del Toro crafts rich fantasy worlds in his films. His adaptation of Pinocchio carries his signature artistry and heart. But as he told me, making this film was even more of a hands-on experience than usual. No one knows, no one can tell. And the whole thing has been called a stop-motion masterpiece. But getting here was almost insanely difficult. To create the smooth, human-like movements, the animators had to move the puppets a mind-bending 24 times for every second on film. How much usable footage would you get each day? Stop motion is like melting a mummified cow. <laughs> you get like one drop of two hours of work. You know, you get a couple of seconds a day if you're lucky. Later in the show, Del Toro explains how mortality has become a hallmark of his storytelling. To kids who see this as, you know, one of the themes of the movie is everybody eventually goes. Yes. I can guarantee everybody at home, we will all die. And you <laughs> say that with a smile. Money, money back guarantee. <laughs> no, because uh, Mexico has a very particular relationship with death. We understand that it's sort of what, there is a great poem by Jaime Sabines that says, all of my life I've heard a voice whisper softly in my ear, live, live, live. It was death, which is true, is what makes sense. Then Faith Saley introduces us to bee corns, whimsical figures made from acorns, sticks, and other natural materials. Oh my gosh. Since 2008, Bird has built over 100 bee corns, sometimes spending 10 hours handcrafting each one. I thought if we set up Junie here, Junie could just be waiting for a chipmunk to come. He then brings them into the great outdoors to be photographed. He's captured a bee corn welcoming a wasp, feeding a chipmunk, even beckoning a bluebird. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Growing up, filmmaker Guillermo del Toro always felt like the odd kid out. Maybe that's why he tells stories of outsiders, like Pinocchio, so well. In a nondescript building in Portland, Oregon, a dream came true. Here, a small army of animators labored for months over exquisitely made puppets, bending, posing, shaping them by hand and giving them life. Good morning, Papa! Ah, oh, what is this? The Netflix movie Pinocchio is the vision of Oscar-winning director Guillermo del Toro. Who are you? My name is Pinocchio. We want you to go to the cinema and see a handmade movie. A movie made by humans to the utmost degree. And you can feel that. You can feel that. I'm moved by that. It is. It's moving. It gets you in the, in the gut, in the heart. It's a big gut. And it gets me. So it's a big feeling. <laughs> they chop me in a firewood. Say the name Pinocchio, and a lot of people think of the 1940 Disney film. Oh, look! My nose! What's happened? A neatly wrapped story with a relentlessly happy ending. Oh, please help me. But the original Adventures of Pinocchio, first published in the 1880s by Carlo Collodi, was a very different story. Yes, there was a puppet boy whose nose grew when he lied, but there were also some much darker themes, like death. And I won't be a burden anymore. Del Toro's vision was even less child-friendly. The wooden boy with the borrowed soul. While you may have eternal life, your loved ones, they do not. You never know how long you have with someone until they're gone. So getting a studio to greenlight it took more than a decade. You said that there's a lot of pain that went into this. What yeah. was the most painful part? Well, either you make the movie the right way or it's almost as good not to make it. It's when you have the whole world uh, designed and you're storyboarded and you have a great screenplay and you know what it could be and people keep saying no, that's really hard. And then it gets harder when they say yes. Because <laughs> now you have to deliver the whole thing. No one knows, no one can tell. 
and the whole thing has been called a stop-motion masterpiece. But getting here was almost insanely difficult. To create the smooth, human-like movements, the animators had to move the puppets a mind-bending 24 times for every second on film. How much usable footage would you get each day? Stop motion is like melting a mummified cow. <laughs> you get like one drop of two hours of work. You know, you get a couple of seconds a day if you're lucky. Of course, at only two seconds a day, it would take forever to make a feature film. So the filmmakers used more than one soundstage, a lot more. How many? 60, six zero, 60 stages, 60 cameras, 60 sets, shooting at the same time. At the start of Del Toro's movie, Geppetto is the father of a living, breathing boy who dies tragically. One night in a fit of drunken despair, Geppetto carves a wooden boy, and when he wakes up the next morning, he sees this. His Pinocchio looks more like Frankenstein than a cartoon character, but that detail, like all of Guillermo's creations, is by design. Growing up in Guadalajara, Mexico, young Guillermo loved monsters, filmmaking, and not much else. You said that you identify with Pinocchio because he was other than, didn't yeah. feel like part of the group, and yeah. that you felt that way as a kid. How yes. so? Well, I was, I was a, a boy growing, growing up in Mexico, and everybody was very physical. Everybody was into sports. Everybody wanted to take walks in the forest, and I, I didn't. As you may <laughs> evidently see, I'm not into sports even now, and I don't take walks in the forest. I, I will walk in a bookstore, but I was an introvert and I was an observer. I always felt uh, out of sorts with uh, what everybody wanted me to be. Hola. He eventually found his niche as a director whose creations could be scary, like the 2006 film Pan's Labyrinth, and hauntingly sweet, like The Shape of Water, about a lonely janitor who falls in love with a humanoid amphibian. The film was weird, wonderful, and a winner. Guillermo del Toro. It won the Best Picture Oscar, and del Toro took home Best Director. Like Jimmy Cagney said once, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my brothers and sisters thank you, and I thank you. But for Guillermo del Toro, Pinocchio has been a lifelong passion project, ever since his mother started giving him Pinocchio dolls as a child. So if your mom gave you these Pinocchios over the mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. how excited was she to see this movie come to fruition? She was very excited, yeah. It was not to be. Guadalupe Gomez passed away in October, just a month before the film's release. In a way, it was painful, but in another way, I knew she was there. I knew she was there with us when we showed the movie for the first time. You knew? Yeah, I felt it. I felt it. I was walking down a corridor, and I was going to turn a corner, and I had the clarity that she was going to be there. And I just had that certainty. She wasn't, <laughs> but I felt it. Safe to say she'd be proud. The Academy may be knocking again. Pinocchio's been talked about as a candidate, not like just for you. best animated feature, but for best picture. I love it, I love it, I love it! And according to Del Toro, that's not much of a stretch. What is it? It's harder in many ways than live action. I remember Ginger Rogers said, I do the same thing than Fred, but backwards in high heel. And that's the stop motion. We're doing the same thing than live action, just backwards and in high heels. And you could say the result is the same, a beautiful dance. When you give yourself a moment to step back and look at this, yeah. after all that's gone into it, yeah. what are you feeling? I go, oh my God, we were crazy. How the hell did I think we could do it? It's like you are seven years old and you're playing with the most elaborate dollhouse in the world and you do it one frame at a time. It's beautiful. And it's almost uh, breathtaking. Does it take your breath away? <laughs> yes. That's why I'm wheezing. <laughs> <laughs>
Stick around for exclusive excerpts from our conversation that you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming later in the show. Up next, art by nature. Artist David Byrd creates magical figures from nature, for nature, to the surprise and delight of his many fans. In David Byrd's line of work, things can get a little nutty. You're like a squirrel getting ready for winter. I know. Bird's nest in Rhode Island is filled with thousands of sticks, acorns, ferns, and feathers. At any given moment, are your pockets full of... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm always collecting sticks because I like them when they're kind of knobby and, and have, like, just the right angle. But he isn't stocking up for winter. At this point, we're going to just kind of choose something that fits. Bird builds tiny creatures he affectionately calls bee corns a pun on the word acorn. When you look at that, you, you get can, a knee. Yeah, you can kind yeah. of see it. I'm always looking like, oh, how angled is my arm right now? There are any number of things that could go wrong, and if any one of them goes wrong, they don't look alive. A toy designer by trade, he spent almost five years at Lego in Denmark. Shortly after his return to the States, inspiration hit. It was Sweeping my mom's driveway at home, I looked down at the acorns and sticks, and I realized, like, oh my god, everything I learned at Lego, I can apply to acorns and sticks. So this is where you keep them? Yep. Oh my gosh. Since 2008, Bird has built over 100 bee corns, sometimes spending 10 hours handcrafting each one. I thought if we set up Junie here, Junie could just be waiting for a chipmunk to come. He then brings them into the great outdoors to be photographed. He's captured a bee corn welcoming a wasp, feeding a chipmunk, even beckoning a bluebird. I don't think people get how long it takes. Well, I don't think people get how much fun it is. I mean, the fact that we're like riveted here, <laughs> we really and are. like birds come and they're sort of around and we're like, oh, is this gonna be it? Like, that's how it is all the time. But life for a bee corn is surprisingly risky. Are you okay to talk about the ones that have perished? Uh, yeah, I'll be okay, yeah. Okay. The most dramatic ways that they perish is when an animal eats them. I mean, circle of life, man. Right, yeah. <laughs> And when you witness an animal eating one of your yeah. corns, yeah. how does it feel? I mean, honestly, it's fine. It's part of the process. I enjoy making them, so I'll just make another. If the camera's rolling and I get footage of it, then that's great. <laughs> Bird first branched out on social media a few years ago. Recently, he's been able to make selling bee corn prints his full-time job. He's held bee corn workshops and bee corn gallery shows, too. People love bee corns because on one hand, it's all so familiar. Like, we all know acorns and sticks and chipmunks in our backyard, and we see it all the time. But then on the other hand, it's like, seems like this whole other world, you know? So the next time you're sweeping away leaf litter, try to have a bird's eye view of those acorns. A David bird's eye, where inspiration can be found hidden in plain sight. The reason I do it is to sort of capture a part of childhood, a certain like sense of wonder about the world that I'm like trying to hang on to. As an adult, we sort of forget about that feeling of wonder. And to know that other people are feeling that and appreciating that is just like amazing to me. And whatever the job is, you do it 110%. And if you are here to tell stories, you tell stories that matter. And that makes somebody's day a little better. My life has been made better for movies many times. More with Guillermo del Toro after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more from my conversation with Guillermo del Toro.
Did you feel like when you were a kid, like you had to change to be loved? Yeah, but I didn't. Yeah, but I didn't. I, I really, uh, that's the thing is, uh, I've been stubbornly disobedient, for example, as a filmmaker from Mexico, I was repeatedly told not to tackle fantasy, not to tackle uh, grand themes or, or genres with a lot of effects because they, that's not what I, was, what I was supposed to do as a filmmaker. And your answer was? I'm here, I'm gonna do what I want. But that led to a long periods of not working, I must say. <laughs> like between the first movie and the second, there's almost five years. Between the second and the third one, another five years, and so on and so forth. So, but, but the ones I do have to count for me. It's worth it to you to have those five years of not working? Yes, because for people that watch the movies, it's a filmography, but for me, it's a biography. What do you mean? What I mean is uh, when you live a normal life, and I'm useless in normal life. You know, when you live a normal life, you, you have your albums, your shows, you know, where you, the family is fishing together, or. Uh, white water rafting, yeah. Those aren't the movies for me. I remember in this movie we were in this country and we were shooting this and uh, the, the kids were doing this and we were doing that and it's biography. You're, you're, you're basically putting your life on the altar of a movie and sacrificing it in a way because uh, you have an extended family during the shoot of a movie of 130 people all sort of rowing in the same direction to get a movie made and you have to lead um, them in a, in a beautiful way, and that's your album. So to kids who see this as, you know, one of the themes of the movie is everybody eventually goes. Yes. I can guarantee everybody at home, we will all die. And you <laughs> say that with a smile. Money, money back guarantee. <laughs> no, because uh, Mexico has a very particular relationship with death. We understand that it's sort of what there is a great poem by Jaime Sabines that says, all of my life I've heard a voice whisper softly in my ear, live, live, live. It was death, which is true, is what makes sense. A life well lived is a life that contemplates mortality. You know, if you go back in time to the refectories in the monasteries, uh, as, they, as they would go into the place where they ate, there was a memento mori which was a, an image or a saying that says, remember, you will die before you have your meal. Remember, enjoy it, have it, because these two shall pass. And I think that's, that's a life well lived. If you're aware of that and you try to live the world in a slightly better way than you found it, even if it's in small ways, because I think that we, we can do that. And appreciate each other and the relationships yeah. we have. I mean, it seems like that's a big theme of the movie, too. Is I mean, I think everybody, no matter what you do, I have um, sold real estate, I tried to sell cars, I failed miserably, I've sold newspapers, I've, I've done many jobs as I, in, in the ages I've lived. And whatever the job is, you do it 110%. And you bring a little order and you bring a little something to the life of somebody else. And if you are here to tell stories, you tell stories that matter. And that makes somebody's day a little better. My life has been made better for movies many times. I've been at the bottom of the despair or this and that, and I see a movie that shows me something that makes me sort of detach from, from my problems for a moment, and that, that, that is beautiful. There is this theme of mortality, that mm -hmm. we have this mm -hmm. precious time mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. Does that mean more to you now? Well, it's always, I, I mean, I've been preoccupied with death since I was seven. <laughs> that was part of the reason I was not fitting very well. But I understand it now. I'm more optimistic and more youthful now than when I was a kid, because I understand uh, that is, you know, if you think about the way we give value to things, diamonds, gold, life, is because uh, these things uh, exist only in a limited way, you know? Why is love so precious? Because it's rare. And we can make it abundant, but we choose not to, you know? And, and, and I think this movie is about love and loving each other, and, and the characters learn who each other are and value each other for who they are. Life, because we understand how brief it is, you know? And loss, 
It's a very beautiful movie about a father that loses a son, uh, wishes the son back, and when the son returns, he doesn't recognize him because he doesn't fit his idea of what it should be. So it's, a, it's, it's full of beautiful things to be discussed. So what do you think young Guillermo would think of this? Oh, he would love it. I've been making movies for young Guillermo all my life. I know him. And uh, he would be very happy that I exist. <laughs> he would say, you're my favorite filmmaker. I go, thank you, young Guillermo. Because <laughs> we make sense to each other. You know, if you think about it, all of my life I've done impossible combinations, you know, to, to try and have a movie like Pinocchio, which can go through tones that seem incompatible. Like, it can be cartoony and funny one moment, and it can be deep and... Uh, earnest and other, and it can be emotional, or you can have a, a slapstick comedy or a musical number. That's really hard, and it's, it's not a combination that many people would consider feasible. But I do it. I do it in Shape of Water. It's a, a melodrama love story between a woman and an amphibian man with musical numbers. You know, those things make sense to me, and they make sense to young Guillermo. And to the world. Well, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't expect the movies. If you cook a certain way, with a certain flavor, if you use bittersweet, not everybody likes bittersweet, but the, the ones that do, do like it. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.